prophets were people chosen by God to speak on behalf of God. These mouthpieces for God would warn about consequences for breaking promises made to God, but also they would remind God's people that he would forgive them if they would confess their sins and change their ways. These messages of warning and of hope are reminders we still need today. Now, the story in the message of the prophet Jeremiah. A little over 20 years ago, uh, I was working at another church, a large church, and I got the call uh, to come down to my supervisor's office. And he goes, um, Ron, got a great opportunity for you. I need you to take here. Um, here's the deal. Um, we have a you know, pretty large recreation ministry and we have hired somebody, but they can't start for about two months. And I need you to take over for those two months. And I go, uh, okay. Uh, we, what about all my other responsibilities? Yeah, you still got those two, uh, but I need, need you to do this. And I said, all right, all right, so give me, give me what all needs to be done. He said, well, the main thing that you need to be worried about right now, he said, we've got a huge softball recreation league and we've got whatever, 40, 50 teams in it. And we've got most of that together. Money's been collected, but you're gonna to need to go through and organize it. And, uh, and then we've got one situation where we've got a bunch of people that are paid. Uh, they've paid, but none of the teams are taking them right now. We've got a bunch of guys, for some reason, we can't, we can't get anybody to take them. And so, uh, but they paid and we don't want to turn anybody away. So we want you to take this and, and put a team together and uh, just make sure, you know, they get to play. I said, well, who's going to coach you? He goes, probably you. And I said, uh, okay. And so uh, can he say, nope, nope, just go do it. And uh, when, when, when this guy comes in, we'll let you know, and you can hand it off to him. In the meantime, you're responsible. You ever, ever had one of those situations where somebody gave you a job you didn't want, you weren't looking for, and you couldn't really see the big benefit of it? That, that's kind of how I felt. I thought, okay, I'm going to pray about this. They understand. I'll have a good attitude. And so I get in there and look at things. We get everything put together. But we still have this group of people out here that, uh, candidly, nobody wanted on their team. Uh, some of them were new, and, and some of them I didn't understand why. But whatever, I figured, okay, maybe they're just new. They hadn't played before. Here's what we'll do. I guess I'll just coach this team like I've been asked, and we're not going to win a game. Even though I'm pretty competitive, I, 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 I'm a little competitive. I used to be real, really, really competitive, like overly competitive, and now I'm just kind of competitive. I was in that in-between spot at that point. And I'd been a coach in my previous life at a, at a high school in South Louisiana. And so, uh, so I'm doing this and I'm thinking, okay, we're not going to win a game, but that's okay. We're just going to have a good attitude. We'll come out, we'll play, we'll have fun and it'll be good. You know, probably a lot of these guys hadn't played before and it, didn't, it actually was a co-ed and, uh, you know, I'll get to pray with people, listen to people, talk to people, get to know people. This will be a good thing. So I prayed, got my heart kind of right. I thought, I got my mind okay, and I told my wife, I said, I know we're not going to win any games, uh, but that's okay. We'll just play hard. We'll have a good time. It'll be great. Okay. So we didn't even get to have practice. We got everybody there together, and so I'm, I'm welcoming everybody to come in, and I said, look, guys, um, you know, I've, I don't know any of you. You don't know me. We've all just kind of been put here together, so all, we're just going to try to have a good time, play hard, do our best, and just go out and enjoy it. It'll be a good thing. So, but here's what I need you to do. Kind of the honor system. I need you to tell me if you've played before, where you play, and if you can play a position pretty decently, would you let me know that? And we'll try to put you, but I'm doing the honor system. So, you know, only tell me that if you've actually feel like you could do it and you've actually done it before. And I said, we'll get everybody in. We'll make sure everybody plays, da, da, da. So this first guy jumps up to me. We'll call him John. And John jumps up and he goes, hey, I'll be your shortstop. Uh, I'm really good. I go, really? And I kind of said sarcastic. So you're really good, John. He goes, I really am. And, uh, but there was something unique about John. John was wearing a polo shirt, cargo pants, and boat shoes. And this, we're about to play a game. <laughs> and so I thought to myself, I guess he's going to change his clothes or maybe he's got you know, some other shoes or whatever. So he goes, I said, so John, you're pretty good. You play shortstop? Yep. I said, and I, and I can bat first. I said, all right, you bat first, John. Uh, pretty good, John. You, you bat first. And so some other guy came and said, hey, man, I... I can play second base and I can play these places. And you know, everybody's telling me, it's all the guys telling me what all they can do. And the girls were, you know, just pretty kind and wherever you want us. Uh, some of them, many of them hadn't played. And so we get out there. <clears throat> so uh, we get out there and we play and we're on, on, uh, on the field first. 
And so, you know, first two balls are hit to shortstop. John didn't even get a glove on. He's just saying, John, why are you doing that? And by the way, John is still wearing his polo shirt, his cargo shorts, and boat shoes. I'm going, John, why did you say that? Why would you? You just told everybody you're really good. And now, you, not only do you look ridiculous, but you can't play softball. But anyway, okay, so, so be it. I have some other guy that's decided he's going to come up and play first base, even though he wasn't supposed to. And he's standing right next to the girl on first base. She goes, what do I do? I said, hey, buddy, you're supposed to be in right. I, I don't play outfield. Well, can you go out there now? Nope. <laughs> can you take a few steps back? And then he comes back up. And then people are just moving around and guys are just doing whatever they want. That inning goes for a while. <clears throat> we come in, you know, it's like 10 to nothing. So now it's time to bat. So now John, the guy that's pretty good, he gets up to bat with his polo shirt and his cargo shoes and his uh, cargo pants and his boat shoes, hits the ball, hits it, the third baseman misses it, and John is doing this on the way to first base. <laughs> he's, he's walking, he's walking. I go, and I'm, I'm coaching for us. I say, John, come on, come on, run. He's going, I'll be there. <laughs> and he's walking so slow that even after missing the ball and even after going, there's still a throw to first and he steps on the base right before, uh, you know, right before the ball comes. And I go, I, I said, John, what's the matter? I says, you're, you hurt your foot or something? Are you okay? He goes, uh, no, these are new shoes and I don't want to get them messed up. <laughs> I said, what did you say? This is a true story. He said, uh, well, these, this outfit's new and nice shoes. I, I hadn't had these very long. I don't want to get them dirty. I don't want to get my clothes dirty. I said, John, we're playing softball on a dirt field. I said, but buddy, you, you got to play. He goes, well, I said, I said, here's what I need you to do. And I, and I am, I'm beside myself. I'm trying to just keep it together, you know, keep it together. I prayed before I came and I said, God, I'm going to do this job, even though I don't want to do it. You know, I'm trying to get my, I said, John. I said, here's what I need you to do. I said, you know, we're all out here playing. Everybody else wants to bat too. And if you don't run, that's just going to be an out. So here's what I need you. I need you to run when they hit the ball. Well, I don't know if I don't want to. I, John, <laughs> you can get some other shoes. Just run. You can wipe them off. Hit the ball. What does John do? He walks a second. And meanwhile, uh, I'm not doing my best ministerial uh, message. I'm going, John, damn it, dude, you got to run. You can't walk. And so come on, man. And I'm just going crazy trying to get him to run. He's out and he comes off and I'm, and I'm still, I go, that is not right. You, you, other people are out here. You said, and I'm just going through it and I'm mad and I'm aggravated for church softball in a game. I knew we weren't going to win. <laughs> My wife comes and she goes, you need to get a hold of yourself. Hey, he doesn't want to run because he doesn't want to get his shoes dirty. She goes, I don't care. I don't care. She goes, why don't you just sit down for a minute and I'll coach. And I go, hmm, take it. And so then she, and then she told me after, she goes, all right, you need to come back. And she goes, but you need to get a hold of yourself. And I said, I don't think I can do that. I'm, I'm not going to do this. She goes, you have to do that. Didn't you tell your boss? Yeah, but that's not fair. That's not right. I, don't, this is, I didn't know people were just going to do what they wanted and just walk all over the field and go in different positions and not run and wear boat shoes. I, I didn't sign up for this. And I'm really aggravated. And, you know, in the next week's coming, and I realize nobody wants, I keep saying, anybody want to coach? Nobody wants to coach. And so for the next 10 weeks, I'm mad every time and I'm aggravated because I think nobody listens, nobody cares, nobody, everybody's just out for themselves. And I hate this. And I didn't sign up for this. This is not the job. This was not in my job description. And I finally get through it. And it's like, I had hated it. It was like the worst 10 weeks. And it's like for an hour, you know, an hour death night or whatever it was. And, you know, it doesn't even begin to compare with what Jeremiah went through. Have you ever had a job that you didn't like? Ever given an assignment you couldn't stand? You ever had one where nobody listened to you? Nobody listened, no one respected, no one responded? Jer that's Jeremiah's whole life for 45 years. God calls him to be a prophet, to speak his word, and nobody ever listens, nobody ever repents, nobody ever joins his church, nobody ever likes him, He's a complete failure as a preacher. And God tells him, yeah, that's what I want you to do. And by the way, uh, Jeremiah, uh, you're not gonna get married. You're not gonna have any children either. You're just gonna do this and nobody will ever listen. Nobody will ever repent. And uh, I just want you to be faithful. Wow. 
I mean, in a culture where success is everything, how would you like to be called to do something of that nature? I mean, outside of Job, I don't know that anybody had a harder assignment than Jeremiah. He's called the weeping prophet, and I get it. Now, with that said, let's take a moment and let's look where we are on our chart. Um, I, I know m many of you love it, and many of you can't wait for it to be over, but nevertheless... <laughs> All right, we've gone through, remember the northern kingdoms called Israel, and in 722, they have been uh, destroyed by the Assyrian uh, war, war machine, so to speak, and the 10 tribes are no more. The southern two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, are down here, and they have been uh, protected for the most part. They've had some good kings and some bad ones. Uh, Ahaz certainly was terrible, but Hezekiah was the best. Then he has a son, Manasseh, who doesn't do a good job. Uh, Josiah is the, the least or the last decent king in there, and then his sons are awful. And now Jeremiah starts with Josiah. Matter of fact, we'll see it in the text here. And he begins to, to prophesy, and he's the last of the prophets. He's the last warning. He is the last voice. And so that's why God gives his, him this incredibly hard assignment. And he begins to prophesy, if we don't repent, then we're going to lose our nation. Our nation's going to be destroyed. We're going to lose our city. We're going to lose our temple. And no one believes him. Nobody likes it. Uh, matter of fact, there are false prophets that are prophesying, and they're saying, everything's great. Everything's going to be well. We don't have to worry about those on the outside. God's going to take care of us. We're good. It doesn't matter. And they continue to preach that message. But Jeremiah says, no judgment is coming if we don't turn things around. And no one listens, of course, and things get worse and worse uh, until uh, ultimately the Babylonians, after a few times, matter of fact, there are three major deportations. We know from history there's actually six. Uh, the Babylonians come the first time somewhere around uh, 607, 608 um, uh, BC at this point. And they come and uh, they're fighting with Egypt. Uh, Israel, Josiah gets on the wrong side of the war with uh, Egypt. So Josiah is killed and the city is taken at that point and 10,000 people are taken out. Uh, they are kind of the brightest and the best of the young men and young women are taken to Babylon and they're used there to serve the kingdom. That's when uh, Daniel, Meshach, uh, Abednego, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're all in that first group, that 10,000 that's taken out, and they are refugees placed in the service of the Babylonian Empire in Babylon. Uh, then uh, we go a few more years, and then we find ourselves in uh, the 597 area. And uh, again, they have not been paying their tribute to Egypt at this point. So there's another siege, and then they take another group of people out, all the artisans and skilled craftsmen, uh, and Zechariah, the prophet, is taken out in this group, and they're taken to Babylon. And then there are a couple of smaller ones that that, that process continues to happen. Uh, they're not paying their taxes. Uh, they go to a period where they're not paying their tribute, and Jeremiah is saying, you need to pay it because this is kind of the payment. This is the cost of what you've been doing and you need to pay it, but they don't listen. And the Babylonian empire gets involved with other wars and they think they're gonna be fine. Uh, Jeremiah gives his prophecies. That's what we'll be looking at. And then ultimately, uh, Nebuchadnezzar comes back. He lays siege to the city after 17 months. They finally are starved out. They come out. Uh, he kills most of the soldiers. And then every able-bodied man and woman, he carts off to Babylon. They destroy the city. They destroy the temple. They burn every house. Uh, and they don't leave a stone unturned. The wall's torn down. And that is kind of the 9-11 moment in their history at this point because the city's gone. The temple's gone in uh, Every able-bodied person is gone. So it's only the, the older population as well as uh, those who could farm, who could farm a land that were left and there's no city. Everybody else is gone and taken to Babylon. So that's the 587, 586 that, that happens. And that's when Jeremiah is prophesying before, during, and then even after. And then they are exiled for 70 years until Cyrus, uh, the Persian uh, general, comes through and destroys Babylon. So that's what we're seeing. That's where we are. This is the last of the prophets before the nation is destroyed. Okay. Now I think there's some parallels. This is the long, actually word for word in the Hebrew, this is the longest book of the Bible. So we're not going to do all the chapters. Okay. Uh, we're going to do a, 
a, a jet view, so to speak. And so, but there are three parallels as you read through this book. I encourage you to do so, remembering it's not in chronological order. You've got the calling of Jeremiah that we'll look at in just a moment. You've got a, a lot of his messages and sermons. Uh, you have the covenant, and then you have the fall, really, in 40, 41, 42. That's kind of the end of it. But then you have additional information that was given to the other nations and kind of, kind of tying up loose ends so that everybody understands what's going on in the book. So that's kind of the way that, that proceeds. There are three messages, and I'm just going to give them to you right now, uh, that I think are relevant for our culture and for us today. Um, three parallels that we see to our day. Number one, people fear the future more than they fear God. People fear the future, uh, but they didn't fear God. Uh, number two, uh, false prophets were very popular. Uh, there were messages being given that told the people exactly what they wanted to hear, and that was very popular at that time. And then you had a lot of angry people about policy, but they weren't broken over their sin. People angry about policy, about what was going on politically, what was going on around them, but they weren't broken over their own sin. So those are three parallels that I see today. Uh, and right here, we're looking at the call of Jeremiah, the call for judgment, the call of the future, and the call of the new covenant. The call of Jeremiah, the call of judgment, the call of the future, and the call of the new covenant. So Jeremiah, uh, we see here in chapter one, uh, the words of Jeremiah. Uh, we see here that he, his time spans over three king, or really over five kings. Two of them are only there for three months. Uh, I'm gonna save us a little bit of time and not read through that section right there. And so it tells when he was serving, again, before, this, before the fall, uh, during the fall, and after the fall of Jerusalem. And then in verse four, it says, now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. In other words, Jeremiah, I have purposefully and intentionally created you for this purpose. Before you were born, I consecrated you and I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And then I said, ah, Lord, the Hebrew word here, ah, means, oh, no, ah, Lord God, behold, I don't know how to speak. I'm just a youth. He's between 18 and 20. Uh, probably 19 years old, but the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a youth for to who all whom I send you, you shall go and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them for I'm with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. And it's true, though Jeremiah would be imprisoned, though he would be beaten, though he'd be put in a cistern, uh, he is never killed, even though his message is incredibly uh, offensive, I guess would be the word, attacking of the government of the kings and of the prophets of that day. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. So what you're going to speak, my spirit's going to come upon you and you're going to speak my words. Remember how the prophets uh, were led by God. They were spoken to by God who gave the word to the kings and to the leaderships of the nation. And that's primarily who Jeremiah is prophesying to, to the kings, to the leaders, to the prophets, he said, I've put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over the nations, over the kingdoms to pluck up and to break down. Now, these actions over this, the second half of this verse, we see this three times in the book of Jeremiah. He uses this terminology, these metaphors, to pluck up and to break down. It's, the pluck up is like pulling up a plant and break it down. In other words, prepare it and chop it up and get it ready to be cooked. To destroy and to overthrow. This is exactly what's going to happen to the nation of Judah and to the city of Jerusalem and to the temple. But then he gives this good news, to build and replant. To build and to plant. So I need you to pluck up the common sentiments of this day. The greed, the self-centered attitude toward, uh, toward faith and toward life. And I want you to begin to break it down. I'm going to give you the words. This is exactly what John the Baptist did. This is exactly what Jesus did before this city is destroyed, before it's overthrown. And then I'm going to restore. I'm going to build. I'm going to plant. That's the call of Jeremiah. Then we move to the next uh, chapter here, the next part of Jeremiah that I think is really important is Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. And here in Jer Jeremiah chapter 7, what we see is he's going to be speaking here to uh, the nation and he's going to be speaking right in front of the temple at this point, in the temple courts. And in the temple courts, he's going to 
uh, bring this hard message and it's going to be offensive and we're going to see that people don't respond well at all. So with that said, let's read our text right here in Jeremiah chapter seven. And he said, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, stand in the gate at the house of the Lord, right in front of the temple and proclaim the word and say, hear the word of the Lord, all you men of Judah who enter these gates to the worship of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts of God of Israel, mend your ways and your deeds and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in the deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Anytime you see a phrase repeated twice in the Bible, that means there's special emphasis on it. You only see in the Bible about three times, three or four times, do you ever hear it repeated three times? This is one of them. And what Jeremiah is saying here is uh, you have been taught, you've been told that as long as you come to temple, as long as you bring your offerings, as long as you are a good Jew, as long as you come, you're fine. You're protected because you're in the temple of the Lord. You're in church. You're good. You've checked the box. And Jeremiah is saying, that's not true. For I'm going to tell you this. If you don't change your ways and your deeds, if you don't execute justice one with another, if you do not quit oppressing the foreigner and the fatherless and the widow and shed innocent blood in this place, if you do not cease to go after other gods that do you harm, then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers. If you will quit, if you will repent, But behold, you trust in deceptive words. You keep hearing preachers tell you everything's fine. You're all good. You're in the temple of the Lord. You're covered. You're Jewish. You're going to be fine. But yet, you steal, you murder, you commit adultery, you swear falsely, you make offerings to Baal, and you go after other gods which have not known just for your pleasure. And then you come and you stand in this house, which is called by name and say, we are delivered. We're good. We're taken care of only to go out and do these abominations. Has this house, which has been called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold myself, I have seen it, declares the Lord. That's an interesting phrase. Behold, you have become as a den of robbers in the gospel of Luke. What does Jesus say as, we, as he comes into the temple to cleanse the temple? He sees all the merchandising going on. He sees the attitude. He sees the spirit. He sees how the foreigners are treated, how the widows are treated, how the orphans are left to themselves. But yet the wealthy are profiting. Uh, they are coming to the temple and they're saying, we're in the temple of the Lord. We're all good. And Jesus comes in and he begins to make a wreck of the money change tables. He begins to cast people out. And he says, this is supposed to be a house of prayer. In Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah said that the temple would be a house of prayer for the other nations. In other words, it was to be an outreach. It was to be a light to all people. But you've made it a den of thieves. Where did Jesus get that from? He's quoting Jeremiah. The big problem was not just the money changing, was because they lived a life that was discrediting to God Almighty. They were breaking the covenant that God had made with them. And they are profiting from it and they're acting like there's nothing wrong and they're saying, we're in the temple of the Lord. We're covered under God. We're all good. And they were justifying their sin. And Jesus is saying, It's like a den of thieves. It's like a cave that robbers and thieves go to where they know they're safe and nobody knows where they are and they're in their own protection. And he's saying, that's exactly what you're doing with the temple. You're making it a place where you're protected, but yet you're a thief. Yet you're a criminal. Yet you continue to break the covenant. And he goes on and he says, go now to my place, That was in Shiloh, where I made my name dwell first and where it did because of the evil of what the people of Israel did. And now because you have done all these things, declares the Lord, when I spoke to you persistently and you didn't listen and I called you and you didn't answer. Therefore, I will do to the house that is called by my name, the temple in which you trust 
and to the place that I gave to you and to your fathers as I did Shiloh, and I will cast you out of sight as I cast out your kinsmen, the offspring of Ephraim. Ephraim representing the northern kingdom, Israel. It was the largest of the tribes. What is he saying here? Shiloh. What is Shiloh? What is he talking about? It's you're going to be like Shiloh. What happened to Shiloh? Well, if you'll remember uh, in the Old Testament, uh, the Ark of the Covenant was given to the people. And when they came into the land of Canaan, uh, they set up a tent, uh, a tent, uh, kind of a dwelling place of worship. And they set that up at Shiloh and they put the Ark of the Covenant there in the tent. And that was the pr primary place they would come to worship. And they would come and they would offer sacrifices and they would have a time of worship. But we see the people begin to decline. We see that Eli's sons become very wicked priests. They begin to take advantage of people. And uh, the whole system is, is disrupt at this point. And, but they're feeling attacks uh, from uh, their nemesis, um, the Philistines. And things aren't going well in some of those little battles. And they decide, here's what we'll do. Uh, this is right outside of Shiloh anyway. We'll get the Ark of the Covenant and we'll take it out before us. And they can't get us then because the Ark of the Covenant Boy, that'll take care of us. We'll be protected and they can't come against God himself who's in the Ark of the Covenant. That's his presence. So we're all taken care of. This will be a great idea. And it doesn't matter how we live, doesn't matter how our priests live, uh, we're good. As long as we've got that Ark of the Covenant, we've got Shiloh. So what happens? They go into that battle with the Ark right in front of them and they get slaughtered. 30,000 people died. They end up taking the Ark that day and uh, the city of Shiloh is demolished. Now, this was the holy city, so to speak. This is where the Ark of the Covenant rests. Now, luckily, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, when the uh, Philistines got it, it, they didn't like it too much because every time they touched it, they'd break out with diseases and there were tumors. And, and they finally just said, get this thing out of here. They put it on the back of a cart and sent it toward, uh, back toward Israel. And so the Ark was recovered. Uh, but the city of Shiloh is no more. And what they're saying, what Jeremiah is saying at this point is this. He's saying, look, just like Shiloh was destroyed, just like the Ark of the Covenant was taken, that's what's going to happen again if you don't repent, if you don't amend, if you don't change your ways. Don't believe this message. We've got the temple. And God would never let anything happen to his temple. God would never let anything happen to his church building. He said, that's a lie. I made a covenant and the covenant is with you in heart and in spirit. There isn't a good luck charm that gets you out of the covenant of responsibility to live a life that honors God. And so that's in fact, what's going to happen. Well, then we go to the call of the future because that's exactly what does happen. Sure enough, as Isaiah and Jeremiah prophesied, the Babylonians come and they destroy the city they destroy the temple. And guess what? We never hear or see of the Ark of the Covenant again. Now, there's rumors that, uh, I, that Jeremiah took it and hid it down, you know, 10 floors below uh, the, the, the temple now, where the temple now exists there in Jerusalem. That's what, you know, some people believe. Uh, others in the Maccabees uh, talk about how it was taken uh, out further into a rural area, into a cave, and then it was closed up and it res resides there till the great judgment. Uh, we don't know what happened to it, but everything that Jeremiah's prophesying happened. The city was destroyed, walls turned, torn down, temple destroyed, and the covenant is gone forever at that point. So these have come true. And uh, during this time when they're under siege, uh, and those who've gone on out to Babylon have been taken. Jeremiah writes a letter to them, to Daniel, to Shadrach, to Meshach, to Abednego, to Zechariah. And he encourages them with this message. He said, I know you hear false prophets telling you everything's gonna be fine. You're gonna come back in a couple of years and everything's gonna be great. But he said, that's not true. Here's what I need you to do. And this is one of the most popular life verses that people use. And uh, sometimes I think it's important for us to understand the context that Jeremiah 29, 11 was written in. And let's look at the context for which it was written in. Uh, we'll start off with verse four. And again, Jeremiah is sending this letter. This is before the fall of Jerusalem, but it's coming. And this is to the exiles, to the people who've been taken off to Babylon. He says, thus says the Lord God of hosts, 
uh, of Israel, to all the exiles who I've come and sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Here's what I want you to do. Here's what God is asking you to do. I want you to build houses and live in them. Plant gardens, eat their produce. Take wives and have your sons and your daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage and that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for its welfare and there you will find your welfare. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to their dreams that they dream for it is a lie and they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed in Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill my promise to bring you back to this place. Wow. Now, the next verse is Jeremiah 29, 11 that we all love. Well, what's he saying here? He's saying this, and again, in advancement, they've been taken off. They are refugees. They are in the service of Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful ruler in the world. And he's telling them, <clears throat> here's what you need to do. I know people are saying, rebel, escape, get out of there. But that's not what God wants you to do. I know you're hearing false prophets saying, hey, he's going to restore you back and everything's going to be fine. That's not what's happening. We've been preaching judgment for a long time, and now judgment has come. Now the city will be destroyed, but here's what you need to do. Here's what your future is. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to build yourself a house. I want you to plant yourself a garden. I want you to have children. I want you to get married, and I want you to have children and let your children have children. And I want you to pray, and I want you to work for the welfare of the city there in Babylon. For in its welfare, you will have welfare. And I want you to do everything that you can. And, and I've got a future for you. I've got a hope. But let me tell you where your future is. Your future, if you're reading this letter, is in Babylon. It's not in Jerusalem. It's in Babylon. Now, there's a day coming where your children, your grandchildren will be able to return. But your hope and your future is in Babylon. I mean, this is probably not a great analogy, but maybe some of you have moved here and you weren't planning on moving to Texas. You weren't planning on moving to DFW. You were never a cowboy fan. That was not what you intended. And somehow you found yourself here and you were fixated on getting out of here. Like, when do I get to go back to wherever it was I'm from? Or when do I get to retire? And I'm fixated on the next geographic place that I can be that has a nicer climate or whatever it is that it has. And basically, God has put you here. And here's what I would tell you. I'm not telling you you're here forever. But here's what you do when God places you somewhere. You get a house. Raise your children. Feed them. Train them. Teach them to walk in the way of the Lord. Teach them values. Teach them gospel. Share the hope that's within you. That's where I have you today. Maybe God will lead you somewhere else. And you don't want to leave Texas. <laughs> and that'll be the same thing. You will need to plant yourself there and make the most of it. Don't quit waiting till you get to some place. That's the lie the enemy tells you. When you get there, then life will be good. And then you'll be doing what God wants you. When you can just get to Hawaii or wherever it is, or the Caribbean. No, you, you would probably do nothing when you got there. God's more interested in using you and giving purpose than you getting to some destination where you don't think you have to do anything. And we, then we don't have a purpose and then we don't make an impact. God has placed you here today just like God had placed them at that time in Babylon. And they needed to hear the message, quit living in the future and thinking that one day then life will be good and we'll be able to do what God wants us to. No, I want you to do it right here in Babylon. This is your future. There's a hope of what God's gonna do with your offspring and there's hope that God will restore and he'll bring back real worship. You'll see the consequences of sin, the wages of sin, and you'll see your need for God and you'll want your children to know that and you'll want your grandchildren to understand that and you'll begin to live in my precepts, in my word, and in my instruction. And that's the future and the hope that I have for you, says the Lord. Jeremiah 29, 11 the most quoted verses on pillows that I've ever seen. <laughs> 
For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you what? A future and a hope. But for you that are hearing this, your future and your hope will not be in Israel. It will not be in Jerusalem. Now, I'm going to keep my covenant. And you're going to learn and you're going to come to that place and you're going to see men like Daniel and Zechariah and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego stand firm in their convictions. And your children will see that. And I'll bring back a remnant to fulfill my promise. And then you will call upon me and you'll come and pray to me and I will hear you and you'll seek me and you'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Great promise in a hard time. A great promise of hope and a future in a place that they had not intended to be nor would they have ever chosen. It's a great message for us today to make the most of where we are for the days are short. Well, then we're also prophesied this last passage, the new covenant. A new covenant is coming. So the people have been taken away. They've been taken for the most part to Babylon. There's some that remain, uh, but it's a very different place in Israel. And we find our way to Jeremiah chapter 31. In Jeremiah 31, uh, we won't read verses uh, 27, 28. 27, 28, go back and they rephrase. I, I mentioned to you all ago, they repeat that you're here to pluck up. I will pluck it up and break it down, overthrow, destroy, uh, and I will build and plant. And now we see in verse 31, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers. He's talking about the messianic covenant, the covenant of Christ. And I will bring them out of the land of, just like when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. I'm gonna give you a new covenant. There's a new hope. There's a new future. This nation will not cease to exist. This people will not cease to exist. And I'm bringing a new form of salvation. Salvation through the Messiah, through the servant that they had heard about. And then Jesus, on the night he would be betrayed, in Luke chapter 22, verse 19 and 20, what did he say? He said, he took the bread, And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten saying, this cup is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood, just as it was prophesied in Jeremiah. You see, we see the gospel. We see a foreshadowing of the gospel through the nation of Israel. What happens? God creates this group of people. Uh, to be a light to others, to bless them, to use them. But they fall away and they go their own direction. And John the Baptist comes and prophets come and they preach uh, the repentance. They try to pluck up uh, the lies and the deceit that have come. And they try to begin to, uh, to restore the truth. And they begin to plant seeds of the new kingdom. Christ comes And though he is meek and mild, he preaches a strong message. And people think things are okay. Yes, we don't want to be under Roman dominion, but things are okay. And the religious elite are fine. And what happens? Jesus is taken. He's tried. And he's crucified. We see the judgment of God comes upon him. And he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. And then he's placed in a grave. But what does the Bible say? What does Jeremiah say? But I'm going to plant and restore. We see the seed of the gospel planted in the tomb. But on the third day, he arose and he claims victory over sin, over death. The new covenant brought to us by Christ through his blood. By grace, we are saved through faith, not of our deeds, not of the old covenant. And we see that picture fulfilled. We see that foreshadowing of the nation of Israel. 
and we are restored to God Almighty. What a beautiful picture. You know, you can uh, read uh, the 13th and 14th century philosopher uh, Machiavelli, uh, Niccolo Machiavelli, who writes the book, The Prince, maybe you read it in college, where he teaches the prince and the princesses uh, how you rule and how you lead. And you do that with a heavy hand and you do that with a harsh tone and you do that through violence if necessary. If you have to lie, if you have to cheat, if you have to steal, if you have to manipulate, you do whatever you have to, to keep the people in line and to be a strong leader. And he looked at Jesus Christ as an example of weakness. And he said, see, this is what happens when you're nice, when you're kind, when you're meek and you're weak. Ultimately, they sacrificed, they killed him on a cross. What a waste, Machiavelli would say. But what he didn't realize was that Christ Jesus, who was God in the flesh, willingly gave his life as a sacrifice for mankind. And when he put, went upon that cross, yes, he died as a lamb led to the slaughter. But when he was placed in that grave, on the third day, he rose again, and he triumphed. He arose, and up from the grave he arose with a mighty victory over his foes, and he reigns forever with the saints of God, and the victory has been won. Our hope is built on nothing less but Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And that's why we're here today. That's why billions of people today are worshiping the living and resurrected Savior through the new covenant because Christ has conquered sin and death. Do you know him? Have you received him? Have you come to that place where you put your trust in him? I encourage you to do that today. Let's pray together. Lord, we come to you as we pray. God, we ask you to forgive us, to give us our sin. Let us be broken over the sin of our heart, of being so self-consumed that we forget those in need. We forget our brothers and sisters who are living without hope, without the hope of the gospel. Lord, let us not go get so fixated on our rights and on our stuff and on what we think we so richly deserve, that we make our faith about us, that we use you and we say, I've got God on my side. I can do whatever I want, live like I want. Lord, let us be humbled and seek your face and pray. Turn for our sin and seek you and share the hope that's within us to live a life of grace and faith. And Lord, when we come in the church, Lord, let us come into your presence. Let us come and sit here at your feet. Let us have a moment where we reflect upon the holiness and the goodness of God and just be still and know that you are here. Let us worship you, not just for blessings that we could get. Let us not make it about that. Lord, you don't owe us anything. You have given us everything that we need. More than anything, Lord, let us just come. And Lord, let us be with you and worship you. Lord, we're sorry when we just go through the motions. God, I'm sorry when we just sing another song. Lord, let us come back to a spirit that seeks you with all of our heart, soul, and mind. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. Amen.